So far, we have focused entirely on three degree of freedom manipulators. Three degrees of freedom is a good choice for number of degrees of freedom for manipulators because that's the minimum number of degrees of freedom, or joints, that is required for the end effector to have a three-dimensional workspace. We looked at several of the standard types of these three degree of freedom manipulators. Things like the scara manipulator or the articulated manipulator. When we look at robotic manipulators commonly used in industry, we will find that many of them match these standard forms. Scara or articulated Cartesian and so forth. However, we will often find that the number of degrees of freedom, that is the number of joints, is not limited to three. In fact, many of these manipulators have as many as six degrees of freedom. In this section of class, we're going to learn why this is. Why is six degrees of freedom a good number to choose for your manipulators? And how can this be accomplished? In particular, how can we accomplish building a six degree of freedom manipulator while also still avoiding kinematic redundancy? To answer this question, let's start by taking a look at some of these manipulators that have as many as six degrees of freedom. Here I'm showing you a six degree of freedom manipulator moving around. As you watch this manipulator move, it might look like it's very complicated, but in fact, if we look carefully, we can see that it's actually just two pieces of individual manipulators stuck together. I'm going to pause the video here for a moment and point something out here. Let's wait until the manipulator gets down into a better position. Pause it. This joint right here, combined with this joint here, and this joint right here, together make an articulated manipulator, a three degree of freedom manipulator that we've learned about previously. Stuck to the end effector of this manipulator is an additional three joints. I'm going to rewind a bit so you can see this happening again. So here we're seeing the articulated part of this manipulator move. And now here is the additional three joints at the end of this manipulator. Those three additional joints have a name of their own. They're called a spherical wrist. Many six degree of freedom manipulators are actually made by taking one of our standard three degree of freedom manipulators and then sticking on the end a spherical wrist. Let's take a moment and look at the kinematic diagram of a spherical wrist and then we'll go back to this video and see if you can see the spherical wrist on this robot manipulator. I'm going to draw for you here the kinematic diagram of a spherical wrist. It starts out with a revolute joint and I'm also going to draw in the axis of rotation for this revolute joint. Now the next joint is also revolute. However, the second joint has its axis of rotation perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the first one. So here's the axis of rotation going into and out of the board for the second joint. Then the third joint is also revolute. and its axis of rotation is perpendicular to the second 
joints axis of rotation. The way I've drawn this kinematic diagram has the axis of rotation of the third joint being collinear with the axis of rotation of the first joint. But this will not always be true. And to show you how that is, I'm going to redraw this kinematic diagram with this second joint rotated 90 degrees down. So if we have the first joint here, and then we have the second joint with its axis of rotation perpendicular, and then if we would draw the third joint here, the third joint would look like this. So if I now draw in the axes of rotation of all three joints, the first axis of rotation is here, the second axis of rotation is perpendicular to the first one, and the third axis of rotation, you can see now, is actually perpendicular to both the axis of rotation of the first joint and the second joint. Now, the way that I drew the kinematic diagram at first over here makes it look like the spherical wrist is kinematically redundant as if the rotation of this first joint is the same as the rotation of the third joint. But when I draw the kinematic diagram as shown in this second picture, you can see that this is not true. The rotation of the first joint rotates like this, and the rotation of the third joint rotates like that. With this combination of three revolute joints, you can rotate the end effector of a manipulator to any rotation you may choose. In fact, that is the reason why we would add a spherical wrist onto the end of a manipulator. With a three degree of freedom manipulator, we have a three dimensional workspace. We can choose the X, Y, and Z position of the end effector. However, we cannot control the rotation or orientation of the end effector. The ability to control the rotation or orientation of the end effector can sometimes be very important, especially if you are doing some kind of manufacturing task like painting or grinding or cutting. The ability to decide in what direction the end effector will be pointed once it's positioned in the correct location can be very important. Now, with this kinematic diagram in mind, let's look back again at the video that we had of the six degree of freedom manipulator moving around. Let's see if we can see these three joints at the end of our manipulator. Here's the rotation of the first joint of the spherical wrist. Go back here. Here is the rotation of the second joint. Let's see if we can see the third one. The third rotation is out here with this right there with the device at the end. Now that we've seen a spherical wrist in action, let's take a look mathematically at the reasons why we would use a spherical wrist. I'm going to start by drawing my spherical wrist kinematic diagram again. I'm going to draw it in this kind of a position so that we can more easily distinguish the coordinate frames for each of the joints. Now I'm going to draw coordinate frames on each of these joints. I'm going to make sure that I follow the right hand rule and that Z is always the axis of rotation and I'm also going to follow the denovit hartenberg rule that the x-axis always has to intersect the previous z-axis. 
Now here that rule is followed. The z0 axis goes here and so x1 will intersect it. But I'm going to have to be really careful about that when I draw the frame in my next joint. So z2 still has to be the axis of rotation which means that my x-axis can either be up, down, or into and out of the page. But neither one of these choices will actually make the x-axis intersect with the z-axis, that is, intersect with the z1 axis. Because of that, I'm going to need to move the location of this frame and I'm going to have to slide it all the way back to here. Now to avoid some confusion I'm going to draw the frame in purple instead of in red so that you can see the difference between the one frame and the two frame. So the Z2 axis has to be that way so that it is the axis of rotation for the third joint. And now I have to pick whether x2 is going to be coming into and out of the page or up and down. I can't make x2 be into or out of the page because that would make it be parallel with z1 and I actually want it to just intersect z1. So I'm going to make x2 point up that would leave y2 becoming out of the page in order to follow the right hand rule. Now I'm going to try to put the exact same frame on the end effector. I have to check and make sure that all of the rules are followed if I do this copying and I see that actually all of the rules are followed. X3 will intersect with Z2. The right hand rule is followed and X3 is also perpendicular to both Z3 and Z2. So we're okay with the frame being as it is here. Now usually when I'm drawing a kinematic diagram the next thing I'm going to do is label the link lengths. In a spherical wrist, we're always trying to get the link lengths to be as close to zero as possible. So we do have a link length here that we might call A1, and here we have a link length A2, and here link length A3. But when we physically build this device, we're going to try to build it so that A1, A2, and A3 are as small as possible. I can also label the positive directions of rotation here now that I have the Z axes drawn in. Theta 1, Theta 2, and Theta 3.